Well, welcome everyone to the Penn State College of Medicine Monkeypox Echo Series. We're delighted that you can join us again. My name is Jackie. I'm a member of the Echo team. I'll get us started with some brief mandatory announcements and introductions. I also want to mention my colleagues Emily and Caitlin are online with me. So if you have any questions or technical problems throughout the session, feel free to reach out to either or any of us and we can help you out. Um, Caitlin will be reaching out if we're having a hard time identifying you for our attendance. So again, um, if you've not done so, please put your name and email address in the chat. Um, and especially if anyone else is joining with you, we ask that you stay muted unless you're speaking. So feel free when you have questions or answers or comments to unmute or use the chat for communicating. Please remember that when we talk about cases, no person identifiable information or PHI is allowed. We are recording these sessions for educational quality improvement purposes. I'll share all material in a day or so after the session. In the spirit of Project Echoes, I'll teach, I'll learn philosophy. We're always on a first name basis during our sessions. So today we're gonna to have a, a brief flash talk on monkeypox treatment and vaccination. And then we're going to have the dis a discussion of a case that's coming from Adam. Adam Lake has been wonderful in sharing case details with us. Case. No, I'm sorry, not Casey. Kat is going to facilitate that um, case discussion. She's also going to be giving the talk on treatment and vaccination. Um, during the presentation and the case, feel free to put your questions or your comments into the chat. We do have Kat and Casey online. I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a minute. They'll help to field questions, but remember this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can ask questions and provide answers. Um, please note that due to the nature of monkeypox and its presentation, some images, some examples, some cases may be um, somewhat graphic. So um, I'm having a hard time looking at myself while I'm talking here. I'm sorry. <laughs> so Kat's ready to start sharing her screen and she has the um, Zoom up here. So I'm like seeing, what's that called? Recursion. So I'm going to just ask Casey to introduce herself so I can turn this off shortly. Hi, I'm Casey Pinto. I'm an assistant professor in public health sciences at Penn State University and work as an infectious disease nurse practitioner at UPMC. Thanks, Casey. Thanks for joining us. And Kat. Hi, I'm Kat Paulus. Um, I'm an infectious disease physician at Penn State Health. I'm very happy to be with you today. Thank you. And I'm just going to mute and let you take over because you're going to start us off with our, our talk. So go ahead. Great, and everyone can see my screen okay, correct? No, no, we're seeing your Zoom screen, <laughs> me. There we go, thank you. Okay, so now that everyone can see the screen, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, the first slides are always just um, about uh, Project ECHO, and um, we're gonna move on and talk a little bit about monkeypox prevention and treatment today. Um, we always start with our disclosures, um, and you guys have access to these, as well as conflicts of interest. Um, I have no conflicts with any of the material presented today. So the goal of my talk today is to summarize the current status of the monkeypox outbreak, where are we now compared to a couple of weeks or months ago, um, and then talk a little bit about countermeasures for monkeypox. And for today, countermeasures will refer to vaccination and potential antivirals to help in the prevention and treatment of this disease. So monkeypox globally has started to plateau a bit with a change in the regional distribution of cases. Initially, you might remember that the vast majority of cases were described in Europe. It has plateaued there with increasing cases in the Americas, particularly South America. Um, there have been 26 deaths worldwide as of the end of last week, um, and cases are rising but not as fast as they were initially. And those trends have been paralleled in the United States. Um, we also had a big surge of cases that kind of peaked in August, and now we've started to plateau a bit, although new cases are being described. Um, there are some states and jurisdictions that are increasing despite an overall decline, places like Indiana, Virginia, and Massachusetts. And in addition, um, Black and Hispanic men have made up nearly two thirds of the newly infected. Um, and so there are definitely differences in cases throughout the US based on region and risk group. 
So I think the vast majority of monkeypox control thus far has been through very dedicated education outreach and behavior changes. But we're starting to implement countermeasures that may help us mitigate the outbreak further. One of the first countermeasures that's very important for control of this outbreak um, is vaccination. And unlike diseases like COVID-19 or influenza viruses, Orthopox viruses are very similar within their genus. Um, and so when you develop a countermeasure for one, you can develop a countermeasure for all. And so we have longstanding experience with variola, which is the causative agent of smallpox. That disease has been eradicated since um, 1980, um, but countermeasures that we develop to combat variola uh, may also help us against monkeypox. And that was really clearly illustrated even as far back as the 1980s. Um, this uh, was a, a case cohort study from Zaire, which looked at monkeypox cases and their household contacts. And they calculated um, the vaccine-specific attack rates versus those that had not been vaccinated in household contacts. And they estimated a protective efficacy of prior smallpox vaccination of 85% for household contacts. So even at that time, we knew that smallpox vaccination was protective against monkeypox infection. And so there are two smallpox vaccines that we have in the United States that can be considered for monkeypox prevention. The first of these is ACAM 2000, and this vaccine was derived from a clone of the historical Drivax vaccine. That was the vaccine that was used in smallpox eradication. So it's very similar to that. And so most of what we know about effectiveness of the vaccine as well as side effects is derived from our historical experience with Drivax. And ACAM2000 is a weakened virus, so it still replicates in individuals. And because of that, it has a long list of side effects, some of which are very serious. Um, some are self-limited, like acute vaccinia or um, ge uh, even generalized vaccinia, which can cause rash and muscle aches and pains. But then there are more serious complications, like a 1 in 175 risk of myocarditis, which is quite high when you compare that to the risk of other vaccines, um, as well as encephalitis or very severe and often fatal side effects like eczema vaccinatum and progressive vaccinia, which occur in immunocompromised patients and patients with eczema. And these are often fatal complications. Um, and it's why the vaccine is actually contraindicated in the immunocompromised. In addition, um, ACAM2000 can be transferred to a uh, fetus in pregnant women. Um, and so just another thing to think about, as well as to close contact. So you can actually transmit vaccine virus to those around you, which has important implications for at-risk household members. And so because of this, there was a lot of interest in developing newer vaccines that were safer. And in 2019, um, the FDA approved Genios vaccine, which is a modified uh, vaccinia Ancara. So it does not form infectious virus in mammalian cells. It's very well tolerated in initial safety studies. And because it doesn't replicate, we infer that it would be safe in pregnancy, um, pediatric populations, and the immunocompromised. And this vaccine is primarily what we're using right now. We have not used any of our ACAM 2000 supply in the United States. It's given as two doses four weeks apart and initially was designed for subcutaneous administration. Subcutaneous administration was um, initially what we did with this vaccine, but because of supply issues, we looked at another vaccination strategy, and that's intradermal vaccination. So instead of going into the subcutaneous tissue, um, you inject much more shallowly into the superficial skin tissues, which are packed with immune cells, with the hope that you can use lower doses of vaccine to generate the same response. 
So to understand how we're using Genios now, I wanted to walk through how things have been approved. So the Genios vaccine was approved for subcutaneous dosing, and that was done not based on efficacy data in humans, but comparative immune responses with ACAM 2000 plus animal efficacy data. So we've never shown efficacy of this vaccine in people, but it's inferred based on immune responses. And then in 2015, there was a study comparing immune responses through subcutaneous dosing via, versus those with intradermal routes of administration. And what they found was that there were similar antibody responses between the two routes of administration. Um, and so based on that, the FDA looked at our supply in the United States realized that we were going to be short of what we would need to vaccinate risk groups, and they decided to use intradermal dosing of this vaccine under EUA because it allows a single vaccine vial to be split into five doses, substantially increasing our supply. Um, but again, this is only based on immunogenicity data. Um, in fact, for this case, there's not even animal studies on efficacy and certainly no human studies on the efficacy of this approach. So currently, the CDC recommends um, vaccination in a couple of different settings. Um, historically, we did vaccinate people for pre-exposure prophylaxis with individuals that might have occupational exposure, and we're continuing to do that. So that would be someone that works with orthopox viruses in a research lab or certain public health um, interventionalists, um, people of that nature. With the outbreak of monkeypox in the United States, we started to give post-exposure prophylaxis. So somebody that had a known contact with monkeypox, you can vaccinate them a couple of days after exposure. If it's early enough, you may prevent disease altogether. If it's later, you may decrease severity, even if disease is not prevented. Um, and then they expanded to post-exposure prophylaxis plus. So basically, people that were likely to have come into contact with someone with monkeypox over the past two weeks. And that was initially gay, bisexual, or other men who have sex with men um, who have had any of the following risks within 14 days, sex with multiple partners, sex at a commercial sex venue, or in association with an event where monkeypox was known to be transmitting. And recently, as of last week, they have started to expand to certain risk groups as pre-exposure prophylaxis, um, so long as supplies allow. So prioritizing post-exposure prophylaxis and PEP++, but expansion if you have enough in your state or jurisdiction. But it's been a little bit um, confusing what's happening in real life. Um, every jurisdiction is doing this differently. Most are giving PEP and PEP++, but many are expanding beyond the CDC recommendations ahead of the recommendation to do so. Some are giving PEP for healthcare workers, depends on where you are. Um, and additionally, this survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation really found that it's very difficult to figure out how to get monkeypox vaccine in most jurisdictions. And I've run into that with my patients as well. Um, the CDC has started a monkeypox vaccine locator that can help you find vaccines in your area, but I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done here to deploy these vaccines to the right risk group. So what do we know about the effectiveness of PEP? And the short answer is not much. Um, this is data from France since the monkeypox outbreak has started. And it looked at breakthrough cases after post-exposure vaccination. And basically it found some, but without um, identifying a control cohort, we don't know how effective the vaccines are for PEP. And the CDC has started to put out um, some information about rates of monkeypox cases by vaccine status. So you may have heard in the news um, this sort of declaration that people that are unvaccinated for monkeypox are 14 times less likely to get monkeypox than um, are 14 times more likely to get monkeypox than those that are vaccinated. Um, but unfortunately, this type of data is unable to control for other risk factor modifications. So for example, someone that seeks out a monkeypox vaccine may also be more likely to change behavior. And so I really think we just need more information on this. Um, and studies are planned by the NIH to really understand the effectiveness of these vaccines and the different dosing strategies. 
So I'm going to change gears a bit and talk about the management of patients with monkeypox. Many of you on this call have now seen monkeypox cases, and you know that it can cause very serious um, skin lesions, soft tissue lesions, secondary infections, um, and you know can be very painful and debilitating for patients. So most patients with monkeypox will recover with supportive care, but an important component of that care is pain management. Over half of reported hospitalizations in the literature are for pain management. And so I think one of the things we need to do well is to manage these patients' pain, even in the outpatient setting. Um, and I put some considerations here in terms of um, how you might think about managing their pain. In addition, there was a recent CDC alert that recommends HIV testing in all patients that present with concerning signs and symptoms for monkeypox. People with uncontrolled HIV, low CD4 counts do worse with this disease. Um, and so testing up front is really crucial. You also need to be aware of the risk of secondary bacterial infections. Um, this is another key reason that people end up in the hospital cellulitis, uh, peritonsillar abscess. Um, there's even been cases of bowel perforation with secondary abscesses. Um, and so treatment and management of those infections becomes critical. There are certain eye drops that can be given for ophthalmologic disease. Uh, corneal ulceration is a very severe uh, complication of um, orthopox viruses um, and can lead to blindness. So something to keep in mind. And then we're going to spend the last couple of minutes talking a bit about antivirals. Um, so I wanted to go ahead with a poll. Um, hopefully, Jackie can put that up. OK, hopefully everyone can see that. We're getting responses, so I'm assuming yes. Give it just another minute. Yep. I like to get to 50%. We're only at about 35, so I'll wait a few more seconds. Yeah, please jump in. This is um we we want these responses because I want to see the variation in what practitioners um, are doing with their antivirals and what data is known. All right. Well, we're all but at a minute, so let me end the poll. If anybody does have anything to contribute, feel free to, free to put it into the chat, but let me share the results of this. So can everyone see that? Yeah, this is great actually, because there's a really nice divide, which I think highlights some of the communication um, issues around monkeypox treatment, um, and will really set itself up well for the next couple of slides. And so the question here was, which of the following antivirals have demonstrated clinical efficacy against monkeypox? And you can see there's a nice breakdown in answers. Some people think sidofovir, some think TPOX, some think sidofovir, brinsidofovir, and TPOX, um, and some think none. Um, and so we're going to talk about this in the next couple of slides. Okay, so there is in vivo efficacy against monkeypox described for a couple, um, in vitro efficacy against monkeypox described for a couple of different agents. So that means in a test tube, these agents will inhibit viral replication in some way. So the first of these are sidofovir and brinsidofovir, which both work on DNA replication of DNA viruses. Um, and so they work on the polymerase and they stop virus from replicating. They are active against all DNA viruses, not just orthopox viruses. So dofavir is actually FDA approved for CMV retinitis. So it's available commercially and could be potentially used off label for monkeypox. It's never been tested in a clinical trial for monkeypox, although there is some animal data that it might work. Um, unfortunately, sidofovir has very limiting toxicities. Um, it can cause renal fa failure, which is irreversible, as well as a number of other side effects, which really limits our ability to use it widely. 
And so there is a derivative of sidofovir, brinsidofovir, that was developed um, sort of to have the same effect as sidofovir, but with less side effects. Um, again, this works in a test tube. It works in animals, but it has not been tested against monkeypox in patients. Um, there are side effects to be aware of for brinsidofovir as well. It can cause very severe diarrhea to the point that you may not be able to give additional doses. Um, and it's also common to have elevations in liver function tests. The third drug that uh, works in a test tube is called tecaviramat or TPOX. And it is only impactful against orthopox viruses. It inhibits a protein that's important for release of viruses from cells. Um, again, there's some animal data here, but no human efficacy data, um, which is important to be aware of. It has been tolerated in people. There were some initial safety studies, but it has not been um, used widely in a clinical trial for monkeypox. This pretty much encompasses the data that we have on TPOX. So these are two very small studies. The one on the right side is actually still in preprint, describes outcomes of 14 patients who received TPOX ahead of this outbreak where it's endemic in the Central African Republic. No control group, one unexplained death, four recoveries and nine recoveries with scarring. Really can't draw any conclusions here. Um, this research letter in JAMA describes 25 patients treated in the U.S. during this current outbreak with TPOX. It describes 92% with resolving lesions and pain by day 21. Um, it does describe fatigue, headache, nausea, itching, and diarrhea. Again, no control group, so we really can't get a sense of whether this is effective or not. So when do we consider antivirals? And I think the first thing to think about is that we don't know if these medications are going to do harm, do nothing, or help patients. And so really using them needs to be weighted against these unknowns. And so I think the CDC has put out some good considerations. They even have a clinical consult line where you might consider using this under compassionate use. Um, some of those are disease related. For example, you have a hospitalized patient with very severe illness, or you have involvement where scarring may result in very serious sequela. And then in addition, certain patients may be at a high risk of complications, even with early disease. Um, extrapolated from what we know about monkeypox in endemic regions, as well as other orthopox viruses, we think those risk factors include the severely immunocompromised, uh, children younger than eight, pregnant or breastfeeding people, and people with a condition that affects skin integrity. Um, they've streamlined the steps for obtaining TPOX. One of the things I'd like to ask um, after this talk is, is how people's experiences have gone with obtaining TPOX. It's still quite unwieldy. Um, you need to contact your state health department or the CDC Emergency Operations Center. If they approve use, the drug will be delivered um, and you need to get an informed consent from the patient. There are certain required forms that have to be returned um, to the CDC. And then there are optional forms that will help the CDC understand um, how, how well TPOX is, is working, what other side effects might be present, look for resistance, um, and checking sort of blood levels of TPOX over time. There are IRB steps that need to be included in here. There is a CDC centralized IRB, but this often requires a reliance agreement with your institution. This was recently published as a perspective in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, leadership from CDC, FDA, and the NIH wrote this. Um, and they said that we will not know whether this is beneficial, harmful, or has no effect on people with monkeypox disease. The CDC, FDA, and the NIH will continue to work together to provide access to tecaviramat for compassionate use while appropriately evaluating its safety and efficacy in randomized control trials. And I just want to sort of go back to what we've experienced with COVID, where there were a number of therapies that people thought worked in a text tube or in animals, and ultimately they were found to not work in people or to even harm people. And this is really important to keep in mind when you use things through compassionate use. And so in that regard, um, studies are up and running to study TPOX for human monkeypox virus. 
Um, primarily, this is being done through something called the STOMP trial, which is rolling out through um, the AIDS clinical trial group, at least initially. There may be satellite sites eventually. You can go on the website and you can look in your area for places that are up and running. As of last week, only the University of Pittsburgh was actively enrolling, but that's going to expand in Pennsylvania to places like Penn. Um, and I believe Johns Hopkins in Maryland will also have a site and the University of Maryland. Um, at Penn State, we are looking to see if we could become a satellite site once things are up and running through the ACTG. So in summary, fortunately, unlike with COVID, there are similarities among orthopox viruses that have allowed us to use prior countermeasures developed for smallpox for monkeypox. Um, but we do need to obtain more information on the effectiveness of new vaccines like Genios that have never been tested in human efficacy studies. And there is certainly a big need for data regarding the effectiveness of proposed antivirals that are now just being used under compassionate use protocols. And I will stop there. So there is a question in the chat, um, is TPOX a new drug or treatment? Yeah, so TPOX was developed um, through the FDA via something called the animal rule. And so basically the animal rule is used when there isn't a good way to establish efficacy in a clinical trial. And so it was developed for smallpox, which as you know is eradicated, so you can't test it in field studies. Um, and also you couldn't take it from a lab and challenge it into people that would be unethical because of the mortality rate and the fact that it's eradicated. And so it was approved for smallpox under the animal rule, but it's never been approved for monkeypox because studies are feasible. And so it's being used under a compassionate use protocol, but there's no efficacy data in this setting. So I see a hand raised before um, we go to that. Um, I did set up a quick poll, Kat, if you want, just to see how many people have had to um, try to acquire TPOX. Do you want me to share that quick before we go to the question? Yeah, I would love it because anecdotally, I'm hearing you know a lot of complaints about how difficult it is to arrange. Okay, so just a quick question. Have you had to acquire TPOX? Um, just so we can see what we're looking at. And then Alawaya, Alawaya has a question and we'll come back to that. All right, well, right I now- have, I don't have a question, it was by mistake, I think I get it. Okay, all right. So let me, um, let me stop sharing. We're up to like 46%. I don't think the numbers are terribly surprising. Um, but this is what we're looking at. And so it looks like based on how I'm reading this, that only four people have, have acquired TPOX. And so I'd be interested if anyone wants to come off mute or place in the chat, um, what type of case they used it in and, and how long it took them, you know, to go through all these steps. And then the comment from Alawea. No, oh, I don't. I don't have a comment. It's just like by mistake I hit it. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I, I um, got. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, no, please. Yeah, share your experience if, if you've done that. I um had a patient that had um lesions that were pretty involved in in their genitalia, so I called the um, health department and they were able to get the TPOX for me pretty quickly and um, to get to them. And did you have to go through any IRB steps or how did that piece of things work for you? No, it was informed consent. They had to fill out a bunch of, a bunch of forms um, and um, no, no, no IRB, no IRB. When Did you have a confirmed case. positive? Yes, confirmed positive. Because that's where I've been seeing some issues where if it's incredibly suspicious, um, no one will move forward until it's confirmed positive. Yes, that's true. It was confirmed positive. 
So I, I know um, if there are other questions about Kat's talk, feel free to put them into the chat. Um, but I know Adam has kind of two related connected cases to walk us through. So Adam, if it's okay, I'll share my slides and I'll advance when you tell me to. Um, and then um, sure. and Casey can help facilitate our, well, Kat will help facilitate our discussion around it. So give me a second and then just tell me when to move on. All right, I think my video froze, but can you hear me okay? We can hear you, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the thought process going through this is to navigate some of the vaccine and treatment um, uh, questions that, that come up through this uh, combination of cases here. Uh, next slide. So there's kind of two related patients, we'll call them patient A and patient B. Uh, patient A, he's a uh, uh, cis male, early 40s. Um, he's been a patient here at our clinic for a number of years. He's living with HIV. His CD4 count's been pretty stable in kind of the three to 400 um, for the past, uh, past few years. Um, and he kind of came to me on this Genvoya and Darunavir um, regimen, uh, which seems to work. He has not the best adherence, but you know enough adherence, so I can see how this uh, this became a thing. Um, he does have multiple uh, um, infections with syphilis. Uh, most recent one was June, um, and uh, yeah, he had at least two previous um, infections with syphilis. So he started with symptoms. Um, and came into the ER initially was not not as painful genital sores and some mild groin tenderness. That was uh, the day after, the, the evening after um, he had sex with patient B. Um, and he had had other partners, but, uh, but nobody for the past two or three weeks. Uh, next slide. So, he encountered with patient B and then the next day recorded some symptoms, eventually gets bad enough that he presents to the ER, um, multiple very classic circular ulcers. Um, the, the folks in the ER um, want to test him for syphilis and think that it's syphilis because he actually came to the ER with his last syphilis uh, episode. And, uh, but they reached out to uh, infectious disease and they asked him to get swabbed for herpes as well as monkeypox. The next day, he's 100% that he has monkeypox. He's just he's looking at the lesions, looking at pictures online, and it, it, I mean, there are umbilicated papules all over his genitals. There's some that are starting on his face. Uh, they're starting to be pretty painful. Um, the physician who saw him uh, was thoughtful enough to get the t box consent done at that time, but we were still awaiting the results of the monkeypox swab, so we weren't going to be able to get access excuse me, to T-pox uh, at that time. Two days later, the patient says it's really hurting, it's, it's getting a lot worse, um, and his test being positive. There's no known contacts that have monkeypox, but I was just with this other patient, patient B, and, he's like, and I know that he goes to your clinic, so he should be in your system somewhere, this is his name. Uh, this patient requests T-pox. I call the Department of Health. Um, I said, okay, he's got HIV, he's got genital lesions, he's got a lot of pain. That's kind of the three main boxes that, uh, that we're looking at. Um, and they okay him for T-pox. Uh, it gets delivered to our office via courier the next day. Um, so the patient was coming in to pick up the T-pox, uh, but he said, you know, I actually I really need to show you something, um, I need a physical exam. And so we got him from everything. And, uh, he comes in, he's actually like head to toe, he's wearing gloves, he's got like a scarf all over his face. He kind of looks like you know, uh, the invisible man from the movies uh, where everything's covered up. So he's doing a good job covering his lesions. Um, but he really has some pretty bad sores. Some of them are becoming confluent. Nothing's hemorrhagic, but he actually has this gigantic left inguinal lymph node that's 15 centimeters. Um, so I've never really seen anything else like that, but uh, that I just had to mention that because it was just a ridiculously large lymph node. Uh, next slide. 
And then I'm reaching out to patient B. This is the contact. Um, he's an you know, cisgender male, early 30s. Next slide. He's also living with HIV. He's been more or less well controlled um, on his Victarv for for a few years. Um, he reports recent meth use, um, and uh, he actually identifies as hetero. But when he's using meth, he has sex with men and women. Uh, and uh, from a monkeypox point of view, he does say, "Well, I did hear that somebody that I was with had monkeypox, but I just use a towel at their place." Um, which patient A disagreed that that was the level of contact, but there we are. He doesn't have any rash, um, but he does have a fever. Next slide. He reports that the last two days he's had a fever. <clears throat> um, and here's actually his, his timeline here, which is a, a little bit strange. So he had contact with patient A on day zero, and then seven days later, he has his regular follow-up with PCP, um, he's trying to stop using meth um, and he's having a really hard go of it. He wants to go to formal drug and alcohol treatment. Um, so he gets some resources. Uh, he gets STD testing and uh, his labs just randomly return with a potassium of 6.1. So he sent to the ER. He actually did a COVID test. I'm not quite sure why, uh, but that was negative. He gets some fluids and potassium is fine and he goes home. Two days later, that's when I call him, and he says, actually, I'm not feeling so hot. Um, uh, oh, uh, well, if you have a fever, I don't think we can get you the vaccine for, for Genios, because I was calling him in order to get him um, essentially a pep dose of the vaccine. Um, but um, another twist to this is that, okay, he doesn't have a rash, uh, so there's nothing to swab. He wants to go to an inpatient setting, uh, all while not quite sure if he has monkeypox or if he's going to get lesions in the near future. So this becomes kind of important and timely to, to know, are, are we dealing with monkeypox or not? I call the Department of Health because in the intake form, there's actually a way that you can request T-pox as uh, post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, this is usually meant for somebody that you know, can't get the vaccine for whatever reason. Um, but this is somebody that clearly has exposure and has fever, but there's no way that I can actually swab him and get a confirmed orthopox thing. Now he has HIV, but he doesn't really have any other risk factors. He's not having a lot of pain. He doesn't have any lesions, let alone lesions in sensitive uh, areas. Uh, next slide. The other thing was the Department of Health really wanted them evaluated, make sure there's not any other infections going on. Um, so I do a telemed visit with him the next day. He's got night sweats, just soaking night sweats. He's got a pretty bad sore throat. And so he has stiff neck, but I can see him kind of able to move it. Um, and still no rash. Uh, Department of Health is still quiet. I've been emailing them a bunch that day. Next uh, day, which I think is a Saturday, he uh, finds a lesion on his eyebrow and his leg, uh, calls the on-call doc, they should go to urgent care. He's tested for monkeypox, um, but also tested for strep throat, which is positive. He has a distant history of uh, penicillin allergy. They give him Keflex. Um, and the next day I call him and, oh, you know, symptoms are improving a little bit, not great. He comes into the office, his uh, monkeypox PCI is still in progress. He reports feeling, you know, somewhat better, not all better. Um, and then two days after that, the PCR lesion from the face was positive, but negative on his leg. Um, so, you know, he does have monkeypox, but it's, you know, he's more or less past the, the worst of it. Uh, his symptoms continue to resolve, but the lesion on his eyebrow is not really improving. He doesn't have any visual symptoms. And eventually he's cleared from isolation, but the lesions never really crusted. They were just kind of these macular papules. Um, and uh, so they didn't really go through the full life cycle of a, of a pox lesion. Um, throughout all of this, the, the poor guy ended up having, I think it was nine different letters for work over like 13 or 14 days. It was just like a lot of back and forth of like, oh, it's not monkeypox, it's, you know, it's, it's strep. And I'm like, oh, we have a fever. And 
this and that. And so I wouldn't want to be HR at his place. But uh, yeah, so in summary, patient A had report sex with patient B, A develops monkeypox symptoms, confirmed positive. B eventually has symptoms, but not with lesions right away. And when he does, it's pretty minimal, but he does end up having to take time off of work. And we couldn't give him a vaccine or start treatment either to treat or to prophylax. Um, so I would really appreciate input on of how folks would have handled this. So it sounds like this was a really challenging case in terms of having, you know, sort of a, a known exposure and then a questionable diagnosis of monkeypox. Um, and so, you know, I don't think there's a perfect answer to this, but I'm very interested in hearing what other ECHO participants might have done or, you know, what, what you would have been thinking in this same situation. Everybody seems totally bamboozled. <laughs> Casey, have you run into anything similar to this? Most of what I do is inpatient, and so I have not had to sort of face this very challenging situation that Adam ran into. You know, I really haven't, but I have to say the strep throat really threw a wrench in everything because, you know, so many patients are positive for strep throat, but maybe don't actually have it. They're just colonizers that I think it just made this case exponentially more complicated um, because it gave us a reason for fever, unfortunately. Yeah, and I think yeah, that's a great felt like point. Kind of the perfect, felt like the perfect red herring, kind of like the 60 year old with sepsis uh, and she's got, you know, 50,000 CFUs on her urine culture. Mm. <laughs> Not sure that it caused sepsis, but. <laughs> It is an infection. <laughs> so Adam, when you went through this case, were you only in contact with PA's Department of Health? Did you ever try the um, mm -hmm. clinical consult line for the CDC? I have not used that yet, so I'm not sure. Um... <clears throat> no, I, I haven't. And my, so the Department of Health has actually um, had left a, a message on that line and wanted to have a consult with the with the CDC about this situation. Um, and, you know, when data is presented, I'm always curious because, it, you know, there's, I always say, oh, rash is present in like 99% of cases. And I'm like, wait, what did you swab in that 1% of cases? Like who's, who's getting treated without a rash? Um, so I know that if it must happen, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, I think it makes sense that they're like, okay, well, you didn't rule out anything else, um, which is fair. Um, but, uh, you know, certainly was, was high suspicion for, for monkeypox. And I mean, now we are starting to see that, yeah, if there's oral sex involved, there's a decent chance of pharyngitis being a you know, presenting symptom or part of the constellation. Um, I wasn't able to evaluate his throat, so I don't know if he had you know, classic lesions back there. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, the, the Department of Health usually, or the last two times that I've had to get T-Pox for somebody, it's like a five minute conversation. It's been much faster. This is kind of one of our earlier cases and um, at that time, it was usually a 25 to 30 minute discussion about you know, what's happening and what exactly are the symptoms and do you know about contacts and everything. Um, you know, the recent two cases, it's like they're immunocompromised, they have some pain, they're in sensitive areas and they're like, okay, what's their weight? <laughs> are they getting the full dose or are we adjusting it? Uh, so it's, it's been very very smooth the past couple of times. And then usually we get the, the courier over the next day. Um, 
Yeah, I'm really hoping that once Stomp gets up and like really plugged into communities, that this will be a good option for people. It's my understanding that in addition to the placebo controlled portion of the trial, there will be an open label arm for immunocompromised and high risk individuals. And so it may be that in upcoming weeks, there's a really nice pathway to do this in a very controlled way. Um, and so I think, you know, that's starting, but we're just a little bit before that right now. Yeah, with patient A, because um, he was on Genvoya with that COBA-C-STAT um, impact, I really wanted to get the PK levels on the Tigabiramet. And I even had a pharmacist trying to help me out, but actually our, our outpatient lab was really, or actually infection control really didn't want us to do that because we're bringing somebody in known to have monkeypox and potentially exposing healthcare workers. Um, so that got shut down, but the patient was totally willing to come in however many times we, we wanted him to. Um, so it was kind of uh, bummed that we didn't get to get some of that data. Um, I think it would have been very relevant. Um, uh, you know, it's going to be a frequent thing that's going to be around, even though there's not an expected interaction with 3A4. Actually, not a whole lot of interactions overall, which is pretty nice. <laughs> it's like midazolam and some old diabetes <laughs> medicine. I can't remember what it is. I think we're peglinide or something. But well, I think compared to sidofovir and even Bryn sidofovir, which I've used in my bone marrow transplant patients for other indications, I think TPOX's <laughs> safety profile looks much better. Whether it'll be effective, I think, is still up in the air. Yeah. I think. Um, yeah, you have to the... guess with some. Very good. I still think one of the big barriers to treatment and um, vaccination, even PEP or PrEP is just getting that positive test to, from their exposure. Um, I don't know if anyone's seeing shortening times, but it feels like it's still very long. I think one of the biggest hurdles is exactly what Adam was experiencing here is that we don't have an FDA either EUA validated test or approved test for monkeypox without lesions. And I think we're seeing accumulating data that even though the sensitivity might not be as great as from a lesion, it probably does have reasonable sensitivity. Um, and I think, you know, once we have a way to test people in the prodrome, that may help with some of these issues. Um, I don't know what others are experiencing regarding turnaround time from commercial labs for lesion swabs. Has that improved or what's the average turnaround that people are seeing when they swab a lesion? Um, Kat, in, I don't know if you're watching the chat, but there's also a really interesting question from Karen, um, especially around the patient B um, with no visible diagnostic criteria. What do they do to help identify these patients? I mean, I think right now oh, we good. just watch them. <laughs> like if they were in our hospital, yeah. we would probably isolate them. If they had fever and unknown exposure, that would be our algorithm. But we don't have a way to test them. So, you know, I think the quest has to, can now be done on rectal and, and pharyngeal swabs. So with them having a sore throat, and at this point, I, I probably could have just done a pharyngeal swab, but that wasn't approved um, uh, before. But yeah, if it was just just fever and exposure, yeah, there's no way to, to test them. And I mean, if you're, if you're in a uh, detox rehab sort of situation, I mean, if somebody's completely asymptomatic, no rash or anything, I, just, I don't really know what their transmission risk would, would be. Um, you know, certainly, if you have a diffuse rash, I assume that it's higher. Um, again, we don't totally know that. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any um, insight into kind of transmission levels or window of transmission and um, 
know, we usually think about it until all the lesions crest, but with this guy, he didn't even have a lesion that crested. So I'm going to put out another question that came in through a private chat. Um, I don't know if you have experienced cat or if anyone else can help with this, um, but are, you know, are, what are people seeing in terms of vaccine reactions? What's been observed for that? Well, that's a great question. And I'm curious if anyone on this call is at a vaccine site um, because we are not administering here, but at least in that comparative 2015 study, there was a ton of local reactogenicity with intradermal administration that lasted out past a month with pretty severe reactions. And so has anyone seen that on the, is there a poll? Can we? Yeah, I've, I've definitely seen a lot of reactions. I think it was actually 100% in that study. Um, I mean, I feel like usually they'll just kind of hedge and make it 99.9, .9, but I think they actually said it was 100% of people. <laughs> um, and that's certainly what, what I've seen. Um, I have to wonder if that's impacting people's decision to get the second dose, um, if they don't want the same reaction again. Um, so maybe unintended consequences of trying to, to spread the um, the vaccine out. Again, that's just my conjecture. No, I think you're right. And it was it was something that was brought up. So there was a lot of debate among vaccine experts about this approach with dissent from major vaccine experts regarding, you know, local reactogenicity and safety concerns, um, not really knowing how fractional dose will affect efficacy. So are we dividing it out only to have less efficacy? Um, and then, you know, I think even provider administration has been raised as a major concern as we don't usually give intradermal vaccines in the United States. So you could end up with vaccine not going to the right place as well. Yeah, and I see a note from Trish in here, and that's basically what was described in this comparative study. And I, I agree, I think it was like 100% immediately after, and then a lot of them extended even out to day 30. That's a long time to have a severe local reactogenicity event um, that's being in a, in a trial, a grade three or above AE. That's got to be pretty significant. Um, has anybody been seeing like post-vaccination infections? Anything to share on that front? Or it might be too early. Cases are still fairly, fairly low. I did see one person that it was just a week after his first dose that he started with symptoms. So he might have actually had an infection right around the same time as he got his first dose. So you could say maybe it was kind of failure of um, or like basically essentially it's too late to be PEP. Um, it was also on steroids at the time. Um, I forget if we shared this case or not, but that was the only person that, we, that had any vaccine doses that we diagnosed. So before we, before I ask Kat and, and Casey and Adam to kind of summarize any key recommendations from this, um, you know, to inform the rest of this series, um, if anyone has thoughts on what, you know, what you may need to be more informed um, and prepared for 
diagnosing and treating. In, in other words, what resources, what information do you still need? Please put it in the chat or you can private message or email echo at psu.edu. Um, so Casey, can I start with you? Just any last points around this case and um, the topic in general? I just hope things keep getting better. Um, I know right now it sounds like TPOX is getting easier for people to access. Um, which it wasn't before. My my biggest hope is that our testing will become quicker so we can start recommending PEP and PrEP more often. Thank you. Kat, any last comments, summaries? I think from, from my standpoint, it's just the importance of ongoing communication about um, the limitations of our vaccines and treatment in terms of data. We saw this across the board with COVID where a lack of good communication from both public health authorities and even practitioners really hurt confidence in vaccination and therapeutics. And so when framing that discussion with the patient, I think it's important to at least a high level address the uncertainties in our knowledge. So for example, when using PEP or PEP++, also, you know, make sure we're encouraging behavior modifications because we don't know the effectiveness in this setting. Or when we're recommending TPOX to a patient, really, you know, making sure that just like we would do in a clinical trial to sort of state the unknowns. And, and I think those things help patient confidence over time. Thanks. And Adam, any last updates or information you'd like to share regarding these two patients? I actually saw him uh, one of them just recently, and uh, he, you know, the, the facial lesions uh, healed up just fine, and his genital ones um, had had resolved. There's still some hypopigmentation there, but um, he didn't end up getting any of the um, strictures that I've been reading about. Um, he was circumcised, so I think some of them, it's more in the foreskin, where some of the stricturing can be pretty bad. Um, but yeah, he's, he's essentially recovered and I'm not too concerned about it. Um, and the other patient uh, was back to work and then he, he just got COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> he's out of work again. <laughs> oh, no. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you all for your yeah, participation well. today. Um, don't forget you'll be receiving an email shortly and it contains a link to the session evaluation. Um, if you're claiming CME credits, you do need to complete that evaluation in its entirety. And if you're not, we still ask that you complete the evaluation so we can continue to improve these sessions. I believe we have a few more left. We wanna make them as valuable and useful for you as possible. So we'll see you again on October 19th. We'll be talking about endemic risk. I believe Gavin is back with us for that one. Um, if you have a case, a question, a scenario that you would like to discuss, um, we love hearing from Adam, um, but if, I'm sure others have questions and have examples that would um, be beneficial for all of us to discuss. And if not, Adam will be reaching out again, but please consider sharing um, a thought, a question, doesn't have to be an actual patient. Um, please feel free to share. So thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your day and we'll see you in two weeks.